Welcome everyone to the next in our studies in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking this time at the opening verses of Luke chapter 12. Shall we start with a word of prayer? Gracious God, our Father, again we come in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ and we be thank thee for this opportunity to come aside to consider thy word together, to think about lessons that it would teach us and we pray for the help that we might know the help of thy Holy Spirit to bring thy word to us, to guide us and direct us in the way that thou wouldst have us to go, that we may know help from thyself to put into practice those things that thou shalt bring before us. So we commit our way to thee now. We seek thy help in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're looking today at Luke chapter 12, verses 1 to 21, and we'll take time to read the verses together. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be pronounced upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you into the synagogues, and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak unto my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Now really the teaching of this passage centres around two warnings of the Lord. In verse 1 he says, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then in verse 15 he says, Beware of covetousness. As we look at the passage, the opening of the passage brings to us an innumerable multitude that have come together to hear what the Lord is saying. And then at the end of verse 1 down to verse 3, we have the warning of the Lord about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
And that will bring to us the challenge about how easily we can forget that the Lord sees the heart. We may deceive men, but we don't deceive the Lord. From verses 4 to 12, we have that put into perspective. In verses 4 to 7, the Lord warns about the danger of fear. Solomon warns us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of man brings a snare. And the Lord now warns us to have a true perspective on what should be cause us concern as far as this life is concerned. And then in verses 8 and 9, he speaks about the question of confession. And there we have the option that, again, perhaps coming from the question of fear, do we make confession of the name of Christ? And he, warned, he tells us to have a true perspective on what it means to confess Christ. And then in verses 10 to 12, we have the question of upholding the name of Christ. And we have the warning, the solemn warning in verse 10 about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which would not be forgiven. And we'll think about that in a little more detail later in the will of God. And that then really deals with the question of hypocrisy and various reasons why we might be tempted to hide something of what we should be saying and the answer of God to that. Then in verses 13 to 15 we have the background to the warning beware of covetousness. As a man comes and asks the Lord to speak to his brother and ask him to divide the inheritance between the two of them. And that the Lord has, after giving the warning of covetousness, he then has a very familiar parable. He tells that very familiar parable in verses 16 to 21 regarding the danger of covetousness. And while we would often use this in preaching the gospel and warning of the danger of leaving God out of our lives, the true setting of this here is against that background of covetousness and it warns each one of us of the need to have a true perspective regarding where our riches really are. And we'll think about that in due course, God willing. So to come back to the beginning of the chapter and to think about for the few moments so that first verse, and we would start there in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people. And we see here something of the background, the words in the meantime take us back to the end of the previous chapter. And last week Fraser was taking us through the way in which the background to this was that the Lord had pronounced woes against the Pharisees and the lawyers. And as a result of the woes that he pronounced at the end of chapter 11, we read how they urged him vehemently with many questions trying to find an occasion, an accusation that they could bring against him. And it may be, it may well be that the context here is that it was that very act of the Lord in bringing In bringing those woes and then the response of the Pharisees and lawyers as they tried to ensnare him in his words that had drawn a crowd together to see what was going on. And it's a, set, it's a reminder to us of the danger that we must not set store by numbers. Here was a an innumerable multitude, perhaps the largest company that had ever gathered together. And yet it would appear, as we 
read what happens here, that the reason for them coming was not a sincere reason. It may well be that the background to this was a desire to see the contention between the Lord and his enemies. And it may be that where Luke is recording his gospel in a moral order, he is reminding us of that danger too, that people may be attracted by a wrong reason. And we need to take great care not to set store by numbers, not to, not to engage in strife. It's interesting, the warnings, particularly when we come to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He reminds us that the servant of the Lord must not strive, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 24. In 1 Corinthians 3, he speaks to those Corinthian believers at the beginning of that chapter. And he tells them that he has to speak to them as babes in Christ because of the strife and division that marked them, which showed that they were living according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. They had failed to grow in spiritual life. And so the warning stands for us of a danger of the crowds. And it's against this background that the Lord then raises this warning against covetousness beware of the leaven again of hypocrisy beware of the leaven of the pharisees which is hypocrisy and we can think of the many examples that we have of the hypocr hypocrisy of the pharisees the next two chapters are going to open to us two very definite illustrations as the Pharisees object to healing on the Sabbath day, the Lord will turn to turn on them and he will remind them that they take the time when they are, when it is the Sabbath day, they will still take their ox and their donkeys and they will go and ensure that they are fed and watered. He'll remind them again later that on the Sabbath day, if one of their beasts was to fall into a pit or a ditch, they would go and would rescue them, even though it was the Sabbath day. And what he is doing in that is highlighting the hypocrisy of men who were setting their own possessions, their own beasts, ahead of the care and concern for other people. And this is something which seems to mark the Pharisees, but interestingly, it seems to be a mark of very much in religious ritual. So many of the demands that people will make are set against a background of what is convenient for them rather than what is right in the sight of God. And in verses two and three, the Lord reminds us that he is looking into the heart. He's not looking at the concerns of men. <coughs> he's looking. He's looking at the motivation. And so he will say that there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. There's nothing hidden that won't be made known. He warns us to remember that everything we say, everything we do will be seen in a true light. And it's a challenge to each one of our hearts as to how far we are living in the light of the judgment seat of Christ. How many things do we do which we would not do if we were to be living in the realisation that they are going to be exposed at that judgment seat of Christ when we will receive a reward for the things that we have done in the body. But the next verse is the Lord appears to be dealing now with reasons why people may show a measure of hypocrisy. And so we have in verses four to seven, we have the danger of fear. People, people might shy away from taking a stand 
because they are afraid of what will come to them. And so in verse 5, the Lord sets. In verse 4, the Lord sets a very important principle. In verse 4, he tells us that men at best can kill the body. And yes, it may be that life is brought to an abrupt end, but that is set in contrast in verse 6. In verse 5, with the God who has the power to cast into hell. And the word for hell on this occasion is Gehenna, which pictures that lake of fire, the final judgment of God, the place where the dead, small and great, will, whose names are not found written in the book of life, will be cast on the day of the great white throne of judgment. And the challenge comes to our hearts. Are we true to our Lord? The use of that term suggests that those in view here are not true believers. And it would be set against the background that the Lord has no time, no place for deception. Paul will tell us in his service, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for example, that he was careful to be open in everything that he did. He never hid away. He never acted in secret. When they came to take the Lord, John records how the Lord can turn round and say to them that he did everything openly. And those who were bringing him before the high priest ought to be able to bring accusations and tell what he had done if there was anything that was against the law of God. And that should be the character of every one of us. Yes, it may be that we will be brought before men to answer for a stand that we take for the truth of God. And there are those who may face, who even today will face the threat of death because they name the name of Christ. But their life should be such that no one can bring an accusation against them of anything that is untoward other than their allegiance to Christ. And then in this context, the question might be raised, well, does God not care? And so in verses 6 and 7, the Lord outlines the care of God. Verse 6, he speaks about five sparrows being sold for two farthings. In a similar expression in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, he will speak about two sparrows being sold for one farthing. And the idea here is, that the sparrow is considered so worthless, it, it would only attract the smallest possible price anyway. And so worthless is it in the eyes of men that if you would buy, if you buy four, if you'd pay for four sparrows, you'd have a fifth one thrown in for nothing. And yet, even that fifth sparrow that cost nothing as far as men were concerned. Even that fifth sparrow was under the eye of God. And the God whom we trust is a God who cares for that one sparrow. And the word of the Lord is a reminder to us that we are of more value than many sparrows. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are we can be absolutely certain that everything is being ordered by one who knows what is best for us. And so Paul will take up this idea in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, when he will remind us that all, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we can rest in that confidence that he has set his love upon us. He has taken us for his own. 
have from the moment that we placed our trust in our Lord, we can have perfect confidence that he is in control of every circumstance. And even though we may not see the pattern that he has weaving, it is sure to be for good. But then in verses 9 and 10, we have the challenge regarding our confession. And again, the danger here is that this could be hypocrisy in that we may believe, but we may try to hide our faith for fear of men. And so the Lord gives a warning to us. Yes, if we are prepared to confess him before men, we have that assurance that we will receive our acclaim in a day to come. It may be that men despise us. It may be that men set us at naught. Perhaps today there would be those who could think of occasions when they've been overlooked as far as their work situation is concerned. Perhaps even those who have lost jobs because they named the name of Christ. And certainly in other lands, the consequences may be far worse. But the challenge of the Lord is this, whose praise do we seek? Are we looking for the praise of men, which at best will only last this lifetime? And in many cases, perhaps, probably in most cases, will not even last that long. and will often just pass away as quickly as it comes. Or are we looking for the praise of God that we know will never, never cease if we receive praise of God? It is something that will last through eternal ages. We will receive an everlasting crown, a crown of life. In contrast, those, those who deny the Lord before men will be denied before the angels of God. And how sad to think that there are those, yes, maybe those who are saved, but just as it were, creep into heaven, saved so as by fire, in the words of 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15. Where do we stand in the light of these things? And again in verses 10 and 11, we have the challenge of speaking a word against the Son of Man. It may be this is in a wider context. It may be again that this is in the same context of hypocrisy. It may be, and we can think of instances that history has recorded of those who named the name of Christ. But then when they came face to face with trial, would deny his name. And sadly there are those for whom the perhaps the ultimate threat of death was too much to face and rather than name the name of Christ they would deny him. But the, the Lord gives an interesting comment here Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. And here, here perhaps is the understanding of the Lord. Seen perhaps in, this, in Peter, as the Lord himself was taken, Simon Peter would be one who denied his Lord. Three times he denied his Lord. On the third occasion he denied with oaths and curses and yet the Lord would take him up and use him mightily in the years that followed and how glad we are 
to appreciate that we have a Saviour who not only saves us from the judgment that our sins deserve, but a Saviour who will sustain us through this life. And even though we may fail him, and no doubt we can all look back on many occasions where we have failed the Lord, the Lord never fails us. And the Lord never gives us up. He's always ready and willing to restore us. And he will always be delighted to take up again those who perhaps have failed. He can raise them up and he can still use them mightily in his name. But it is in this context that we read here of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that shall not be forgiven. And that is very specific. Matthew makes it very clear that this is the idea of those who attributed the works of the Holy Spirit of God through the person of the Lord to the power of Beelzebub, the power of the devil. It is not, this is not just a light denial. This is openly, blatantly undermining the claims of God, the claims of the Holy Spirit. It was seen in the days of the Lord, as we say, it's highlighted by Matthew in the context of those who said that he was working in the power of the devil and he was using demonic power to overthrow the demons. It would be the same issue that underlines those in, that we read of in the book of Hebrews who had made profession of faith but then had gone back and they had made a choice faced with the cost of following Christ. They had made that choice that they would rather identify with the temple, with the Jewish community in a denial of Christ than to suffer the consequences of being marked out as followers of Christ. As such, it would be something that was specific to that generation. It would not be something that is carried forward in every generation. And we need to appreciate that as we look at the truth of God today, and Paul makes this, so John rather makes this very clear in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And he'll say again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even in that epistle, when he speaks about a sin unto death, it is against the background of those who have denied the power of God, and the spirit of God, those who have been guilty of this act of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so we have the warning of hypocrisy and the challenge to our hearts that we must be open in all our dealings. And then we come to verses 13 to 21 and we have the question of covetousness. And it starts with the question in verse 13, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. In verse 14, the Lord gives a simple answer to that. Who made me a judge? or a divider over you. He had no authority. And this is an important lesson for us to grasp today. We're living in a day when there is urging to political action, it, whether it would be in terms of voting in elections, whether it would be in terms of protesting against political decisions, whether it would be in terms of trying to bring about legislation 
which may be in itself commendable and according to the word of God. The principle as far as we are concerned is that as far as the authorities of this world are concerned, our Lord has no place. This world has rejected him. He is leaving the world to go its own way. We should not be surprised when we find that there is legislation that undermines the truth of God, legislation that goes against God. In Isaiah chapter 5, the nation of Israel were guilty of calling evil good and good evil. And if that was true of the nation that had the word of God and were set up on the basis of the commandments of God, we should not be surprised to find that that is equally true or even more true in societies that are set up against a heathen background. And so verse 14 reminds us that our Lord had no place and therefore we as his people have no place in the political activities of this world. But then in verse 15 the Lord had the underlying root of the problem with the man he says beware of covetousness whatever the rights and wrongs of the case may be and it may well be that the man had a legitimate claim to the part of the inheritance that he was asking for whatever the situation may be the Lord is emphasizing the fact that that man that such an attitude in, as seen in that man is a picture of covetousness it's a picture of that covetousness that desires something that we do not have and it doesn't matter how right or wrong the claim may be we should not be marked by that spirit and the lord is going to explain why in the parable in the verses that follow He's going to tell us and give us a challenge about where we lie, but we, where our affections lie. But before that, we need to remember that we are told as we go through the New Testament, for example, Paul will tell us that covetousness and idolatry go hand in hand covetousness which is idolatry and this will bring us challenge to our hearts because we may look and we may say well i do not i wouldn't have idols it may be we don't have physical idols very few these days would have physical idols. Certainly in typical Western society. But it may be we don't make idols of men in the way that perhaps many will make idols of the stars of sports or entertainment. But the Lord is warning us here that we may make an idol of our riches. This was really the underlying root with the ruler who came and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And when the Lord told him to go and sell what he had, the Lord was exposing the covetousness of his heart. And he was exposing the idolatry that the man set store by his riches rather than by the power of God to support him. And so as we think of the Ten Commandments, they begin and end at the same point. They begin with hope and idolatry, thou shalt have no other God before me. They end with the warning of covetousness, thou shalt not covet. And that would bring to us not the open idolatry, but a heart that sets store by things that have no value as far as eternity is concerned 
And so that's where the parable comes in its context in verses 16 to 21. And here is a rich man. And perhaps as we think about this man, it may well be that there would be nothing directly wrong outwardly in what the man does. His ground has brought forth abundantly. He's got much to set store by. He's got an abundant harvest. And he says, what shall I do? And he decides to pull down his barns and build greater and bestow all his fruits, all his goods. He's going to put everything away. Now, as we go through the New Testament, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul does speak about those who are rich in this world. And it is not that the riches in themselves are wrong. There are two dangers with riches, but the riches in themselves are not wrong. We'll come back to the dangers in a moment. But for the moment, the fact that a man is rich is not in itself wrong. The fact that he's made provision of itself is not wrong. The issue is with the heart of the man in what he has done. And this is where we come back to that question. If a person is rich, there are two dangers. Firstly, in 1 Timothy 6, Paul will tell us there is the danger of being high-minded. A man who is rich is thinking about himself, thinking about his wealth, thinking about his riches. He thinks that he has got something that other people haven't got. And Paul has to tell the rich among the believers not to be high-minded. And so he'll say, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And so riches is not a reason to belittle other people, which is effectively what they would be doing by being high-minded. I have done better than you. And perhaps we may not have that direct attitude. But, you know, perhaps we have that attitude sometimes and we see that attitude when we think of those who would look down and say, well, if they had worked like I'd worked, they haven't got what they could have had because they haven't tried in the way that I have tried. And none of us are in a position to pass judgment on other people. Maybe again, the riches in themselves are not wrong. But earlier in 1 Timothy, that was verse 17, we were reading verse 10, that well-known verse, the love of money is the root of all evil. And while riches in themselves are not wrong, the love of money is at the root of every form of evil. There is nothing that a man would not do for love of money. And that really is the simple idea of covetousness. And so we see again a second danger. And the third danger we have at the end of verse 17 of 1 Timothy 6. And the danger which was abundantly clear in the man that we've read of here, that the Lord is telling us of in Luke chapter 12. Trust not in uncertain riches. This man trusted in his riches. I've got everything I need for many years ahead. I don't need I don't need to work for myself. I don't need anybody else to help me. Sadly, he was also saying in his heart, I don't need God to uphold me. And, you know, here is a very big danger, and perhaps in affluent society today, it's a danger that we very much need to 
beware of. If we set our hearts on the things of this world, and it may be, it may be that this is where a day, big, the biggest danger arises in the Western world. Maybe it is the biggest reason for weakness in the testimony to the name of the Lord. That we have everything we need. And it comes to us, in most cases, believers will have just what they need. They have an income. They maybe have pensions to support them, whether it will be employment or pension. There will be the income to provide for the necessities of life. And we don't need to look to God. And the danger is that the result is that we can spend our lives resting in the fact that we've got maybe money behind us maybe an income that will support us and we're not looking to the Lord to meet our needs and we've come we've come to ignore the warning of Paul in 1 Timothy 6 that we should not trust in uncertain riches but in the living God and that is exactly what this man did and for him there was a stark reminder because as he sat back and he'd set everything by and laid up for years ahead for the rest of his life as he thought the word of God came to him doubtful a person without wisdom that's the idea of the word fool in this context context no wisdom and why did he have no wisdom because God says this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He had everything he wanted but he would leave it all behind. And that again is the principle that Paul outlines in 1 Timothy 6 that all we are doing everything we have is going to be left behind. And he tells, instead of being rich as far as this world is concerned, we trust in the living God. We should be marked by doing good, by being rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the God to come, against the time to come. And here's the choice. Here's the true perspective as far as riches are concerned. Are we living for this world? Do we have what this world, what we require as far as this world is concerned? Or are we recognising that everything that we have has been given by us, has been given to us by God, so that we can use it for his praise, for his glory, for the benefit of others, and in doing so, we will be laying up treasure in heaven. And rather than laying a foundation for years in this life, which leads to an emptiness in eternity, we lay a foundation for the ages of eternity with a reward that will never be taken away. And so we have the danger of hypocrisy and fear that will offer the answer to fear that will often underlie it if we have a true perspective and we have the danger of covetousness and once again how a true perspective on the value of riches will deal with that and so shall we just close with a, a short word of prayer our gracious god and father again we just thank thee for this time around thy word we thank thee again for the example of our Lord, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And Father, we pray that thou would help us to live a life worthy of him, to show that same grace in our lives. For the glory of thy name, we ask it in the precious name 
of our Lord Jesus Christ.